I want to start by reading a passage out of Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. This is a passage I'm sure many of you are familiar with. I'm reading out of the uh, English Standard Version. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, probably like most of you, I have been taught that that is talking about Jesus, that essentially we are uh, looking around the world, we found this pearl of great price, that this is Jesus, and that we find the treasure in Jesus. And I was meditating on this a while back, and I'm, I'm questioning that now. Because the parable directly in front of it is about the wheat and the tares, the wheat and the weeds. The parable directly behind it, right after this, is the one about the fish, the good fish and the bad fish they're sorting out. Now, it's interesting that most of us are comfortable being good wheat or a good plant, or we're comfortable being a good fish, but we would never want to think of ourselves as treasure, something that valuable, something that someone had to sell or give all that he had for you. I wonder if this weekend we can look at our lives a little bit differently than in fact you are treasure. You are extremely valuable. You are worth giving it all for. A woman came to my office. Her name was Deborah. She was very nervous. Her knee was bouncing up and down and I could smell the cigarette smoke on her breath, which for a vascular brain surgeon is not what we want to smell. She had a brain aneurysm, and she was there to, very nervous, was there to get it fixed. I explained to her the risks. It didn't look like it needed to be done right away. It looked technically very difficult. So I was trying to delay her, and I thought, well, why don't, we, why, don't, why don't you try to stop smoking first, and we'll do this later. She said, no, no, I, I really want it done right now. She said, well, if someone's pushing me, I said, well, you understand the risk, because it's very high risk, um, and waiting really doesn't have that, that much risk. No, I, I really think it, I want it now. I generally ask people, you know, you think about it, you pray about it. If it's something that you you really want done, I can't tell you if your aneurysm is or isn't going to bleed, but if you want it done, we'll we'll do it. Well, she insisted that we do it right away. And so uh, I always ask people, um, you know, she was a a woman of faith. She said she went to to the church every week uh, and said her prayers every week and was very comfortable with this situation. And what I do is I ask people that I I say I offer prayer before your surgery. If that's something you would like, you can ask me for that on on the morning of your surgery. And she, like many people, said, oh, I want that. And so I said, fine. We uh, lined her up for the surgery. And I saw her about two weeks later. In the preoperative area, I was coming up, and she just looked fairly calm. She actually looked much calmer than she had in my office. And we went through the risks, and she nodded her head, I understand. Uh, And then she said uh, something I uh, have never heard anyone say before they're about to get on the operating table. She said, "Uh, it's okay if I die, don't worry about it. (laughs) Well, being that I'm a surgeon and not a psychiatrist, I just ignored that. But I did say a prayer with her before uh, going into the, to the surgery. So we got into the surgery, and things were uh, going pretty well. But her arteries, because of the smoking, and she said, well, she tried to stop, but you know, just couldn't. 
The arteries were very difficult. It's sort of like you know, driving down a road with potholes, or if you're trying to, if you're in a movie theater, and you're, you're trying to squeeze back to your seat, you're trying to not to step on somebody's toes. It's that kind of thing. I'm entering here in the femoral artery. I'm snaking this little tube all the way up into the brain. But if, if these little arteries have a lot of uh, plaque or sort of grunge, or, or just it's, it's a, a lot of miles of bad road is what she had. Ultimately, I was able to get up into the, into the brain aneurysm, which was directly in the center of her brain. So if you drew a line between your eyes and between your ears, where those lines would intersect, that's where this was. It was difficult to fix. It wasn't um, straightforward, so it took a while, and I was uh, maneuvering these uh, little catheters and tubes around. Ultimately, I got a situation where I thought it was, it was doing pretty well. And I went to shoot an angiogram, which is running the, the contrast dye up through the vessels to see uh, the, the picture on the screen, to see what it was looking like. And I was expecting to see the aneurysm was closed. What I saw was that all the blood vessels to her brain were closed, and especially the vessels to the brain stem. And so I, I said, oh, no, you know, this, is, this is not good. And when you're in a situation like that, you know, the first thing that goes through your mind as a surgeon is, you know, who am I going to have to explain this to? You know, while you're, because you just get this panic. It's probably like if, you know, whatever you were doing, if you, if you got in an accident with your car or something, all of a sudden your mind is sort of whirling. Okay, what, what am I going to have to do to fix this? But also, what is this, what is this going to cost me? What am I going to have to, how am I going to fix this? And so I'm trying to think, did she bleed? Uh, did she clot? What is going on with this uh, brain problem? And also thinking, okay, well, she didn't have any family. And then I get this thought, well, she actually said it was okay that she died. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, it's not okay with me if she died. <laughs> God, I need some help here. Um, you know, I said, I'd said a prayer with, uh, with her, and also I, I often say a prayer with the technologist before we start. And, but at this time, I said, God, look, it's not okay with me if she dies. I don't know why she said that now. It's coming back to me. Um, what is going on between her and you and, and whatever else. But it's not okay with me if she dies. And I start working furiously. And when you're working like this, the, the body is just dumping this adrenaline into your system. So it feels like you've... You've had four cups of coffee, and you're, you're, you get almost this wave of nausea that comes on you because uh, you're, you're so uh, trying to do anything to reverse this situation. Well, it took about 20 minutes before I was able to get this, these brain vessels open and whew, breathe a big sigh of relief. Okay, the vessels are open. The aneurysm is closed. Let's see if she wakes up. So I finished the, pulled out the, the tubes and the catheters, closed up the puncture site, uh, went out for a bit, got, a, got some water, trying to flush some of that adrenaline out of my system, and sat down to write my post-operative note. And as the anesthesiologist was waking her up from the anesthesia, uh, I heard some commotion over there, and sure enough, she was uh, waking up and she was fighting them. And this happens occasionally, but she was really, I mean, she hit the nurse, she hit the anesthesiologist. They called me over, uh, and so I went over there, and I'm, you know, dodging blows, and I got up, you know, kind of to, the, to her head. I put my hand on her shoulder, Deborah, hey, it's Dr. Levy, uh, I'm here. And then she sort of settled down, and we, they took her up to the recovery room. Well, I went and, and uh, drank a little more water and went up to the recovery room. But I was exhausted, just like you would be if you've, you know, had uh, this, you know, if sometimes you have a, a near miss in your car or something, it kind of makes your heart pound, and you, it just takes, it takes a little bit of energy out of you. Well, this was 20 minutes of that, and so I was, I was really tired. But I came up to the recovery room, and, and I saw Deborah, and she was, she was crying. And that happens with, with surgery occasionally. People are so anxious, so nervous before their surgery, that after surgery, they're, they're, they're just overcome with, with the joy of having survived. And so I said, uh, Deborah, you know, the surgery was difficult, but were we able to fix the aneurysm? I think you're going to be fine. 
And she said, uh, I don't want to be fine. I was supposed to die. Well, I didn't know what I'm supposed to say to that. Like, I'm sorry. or <laughs> What is the right answer? I, I... And <clears throat> I'm not sure about other surgeons, but neurosurgeons, we actually like a little bit of gratitude. <laughs> And I wasn't getting any of that, and so I did what surgeons do with uh, emotional women. I patted her on the hand, <laughs> and I left it for the nurses to deal with. <clears throat> and it took me a while to recover. I, you know, I went, uh, had to go for a run that night, trying to get all that adrenaline out of my system. You know, it's something you may not understand about physicians. It, it, it does cost you to do especially surgery. It definitely costs you to do surgery, especially when things aren't going well. And that when somebody wakes up from surgery, it's all done, so they don't identify with that. But it had cost me a, a lot to do this woman's surgery. Well, I saw her two weeks later, last patient of the day, and I'm thinking to myself, well, look, uh, She's had two weeks to think about this. I'm sure she's uh, got a new lease on life and things are different now. Uh, she's probably going to be grateful that she's alive. Well, I was wrong. She's not. <laughs> she still was upset that, uh, that she had survived. And I'm thinking, well, you were planning, you know, you wanted to die. Why did you choose me? <laughs> it's not very flattering. So I start in, you know, how's everything going? Is your puncture site healed up? Just doing the usual housekeeping. Uh, yes, it's fine. And I smell, you know, smoke on her breath. So I'm realizing, you know, she's doing her best to destroy all this work that I've just done. And so I'm not really happy about this woman. Uh, I, I, she's ungrateful. She is uh, bitter. She is, you know, doing her best to to ruin all this work that cost me so much to do. I, I, I don't really like her. Uh, I, I, I actually want to get her out of the office as soon as possible. So I say, um, so you have a, you, you could go see a psychiatrist. She said, oh, she said, I've got one of those. He put me on these antidepressant meds. Yeah, they're not working. Hmm. Well, you know, actually, if you saw a psychologist, they actually talk to you. You might want to see, oh, I've got one of those, she said. I've got a psychologist. <laughs> Who can I send her to? <laughs> and so I'm, I'm trying to think of anyone else, and, and I'm, there's a saying that I that I like that says your joy in life has everything to do with how you treat the weak. Your joy in life has everything to do with how you treat the weak or how you treat weakness when you see it. See, our culture doesn't like weakness. We like to marginalize. We like to get it away from us because let's the professional Caretakers take care of weakness. But the thing is, depending on how high of a status your career is, you have probably spent a lot of time pretending you don't have any weakness. For neurosurgeons, that's what we do. So weakness is in other people. It's in the patients. It's certainly not in me. You have to look pretty hard to try to find some of that. That's, that's our game. But everyone has weakness. And so as you treat weakness with tenderness, you're actually treating your own weakness with tenderness because we've all got weakness. It's especially difficult with the, the closer people are to you. The more we pull up their faults and we have trouble with their weaknesses, their tempers, their whatever you want to call it, their shortcomings, which we can see in 3D, 
And that's what we like to, that's how we like to think about them. But I just want to encourage you. Jesus was very tender toward weakness. And so I shoot up a prayer and I say, God, I, I don't like this woman. I need, I, I need some help. I don't see anything about her that's good. I just want her out of here. Would you, would you help me? Would you show me what you see? Because I, I don't see anything redeemable about this woman. This is just a miserable, depressed, ungrateful woman. Well, after you pray something like that, you can't really kick her out of the office. You've actually got to, <laughs> got to talk to her. So I said, well, Deborah, um, you know, why is it that you want to die? Well, she said, you know, I've been, I've been not just wanting to die, I've been, I've been praying to die. I said, oh, that's, that's why you're going to church, to praying to die. Why? Well, and that's the question that sometimes we don't want to ask because you, it opens Pandora's box. But maybe this is a divine appointment and I needed to ask that. Well, she said, my, my father was abusive to me and... I've been married three times. Nobody's going to want me. As we sort of went through a quick chronicle of her life, she had experienced a lot of pain. I even talked with her briefly. I said, well, you know, have you thought about, um, you know, forgiving your, your father and trying to move past that? Oh, I'll never do that. But as much as I hate my father, I hate my mother even more. But they're both dead now, and all of this bitterness. And then the men in her life, and she, the first man she married, she really married him, uh, or she got pregnant just to get out of the house, just to get away from her father. So that marriage didn't really last very long. And the second man that she married, she really thought he was a, a, a good man uh, because he really didn't touch her before they got married physically and she was so uh, respectful. Problem was, he didn't touch her after they got married either. <laughs> and so, again, just left sort of alone and um, hurting and so they ended up divorced. And the third man she married was a beautiful man. He was a dancer. He was charming. Uh, he was her dream. And he promised he didn't have any money. And so she was sort of paying for everything. And she learned that he actually had done this a few times. And that she was paying for his drugs. And ultimately felt foolish that a lot of people had said, don't marry the guy, this is, there's something about him we don't like, but she had went forward with it anyway and felt foolish and um, devalued. And so I said to her, have you learned anything from those relationships? Oh, she said, I've learned plenty. And so I went over on the board, and I have a little white board in my office, and I wrote the word wisdom. I said, you are wiser now than you were before those relationships, I bet. Oh, yes, she said, I will, I will never make those mistakes again. I said, now be careful. Be careful how you talk about not making mistakes, because the goal is to be free to make mistakes but to be able to be forgiven for your mistakes. We don't want to lock you in a box that you can never make another mistake. That's a prison. And you're a woman of faith, and so uh, Jesus comes to give us freedom. He doesn't come to, to just lock us in a prison that we can't make another mistake. But you probably have something with all of those experiences. I bet you could probably counsel some people about relationships. You're, I imagine you're an expert at 
Well, she said, you know, my, uh, my friend, she married a rich man. She lives on a yacht. She doesn't have any problems. I said, well, I wouldn't want advice from your friend if she doesn't have any problems. Because I've got problems. And I need to know someone who's had a problem, who's been through that, who can actually tell me how to get out of it. Oh, she said, I never thought about that. Yeah, I mean, living on a yacht and with no problems is not necessarily a good life. It is comfort. But there's something about life that is supposed to challenge us. And fulfillment comes not when you have an absence of problems, but fulfillment comes when your gifts are matched to your problems. Or you're learning to problem solve with your Heavenly Father. You're learning how to reframe this problem as an opportunity, as something that God wants to work with you through. Hmm, she said, I never, I never thought about that. And I said, Deborah, I know that you know, a lot of people that attend church, they when they see divorced people or separated people, you know, they they look down on them. How do you see divorced people? I said, oh, I'm, I don't look down on them. I said, so I wrote compassion on the board. You have developed compassion through these heartaches that you couldn't have developed any other way. Most of us uh, who don't go through that have a little arrogance and uh, look down our noses at people who have relational problems. But if you've had some, you become very compassionate. It softens our hearts. You know, Deborah, how do you, what is your self-talk like? Like, for the things that you say to yourself. Like, do you say, you know, uh, can you say, I'm, I'm beautiful? Oh, no, she said, I can't say that. I don't, I don't believe that. Hmm. Well, God says you're beautiful. And if you don't believe what God says about you, whose words are you believing? Who's... Whose opinion about you are you taking as the truth? So I want you to think about it for a minute. Now, there have some, been some people in your life who have not treated you as beautiful, that have treated you as disposable or as uh, less, having less value. But that's not your true value. Your true value is set by the price that was paid for you. I want you to think about it for a moment. And I want you to ask yourself, why can't I believe that I am beautiful? Why can't I believe that I am a treasure, a pearl of great price? Why, does that, why is that a problem for me? What voices am I listening to that are telling you, no, no, that's not you, because you made this mistake, because of whatever reason, I want you to... And I'm going to stop right now and I want to give you a few moments to think about this because this is important. If you can't say I'm beautiful, I'm intelligent, I'm a treasure, then we've got an internal problem because that is, those are the things that God is saying about you. Yes, there's always someone on a magazine cover more beautiful. There's someone at work, whether you're a neurosurgeon or not, always somebody more intelligent. Yes, there's always you know, somebody that's more valuable in the public eye. But God says, you are my treasure. You are beautiful. I made you this way, and I believe that you're beautiful. And can we push back against those voices? And can we argue with them to the point that we can say about ourselves, yeah, I, I, I believe I'm beautiful. And so I'm going to give you a few moments, because I let Deborah just sit with that for a moment. And I said, I'm not going to push you into saying it, because if you say something you don't really believe, or you don't even want to believe, it doesn't, it doesn't have the same effect. But the research shows that affirmation, saying affirming things that either you believe or you want to believe, you recognize that's the truth. Yes, I don't, I don't maybe really believe it from my heart, but I, I sure would want to believe that. I believe that's the truth. As we say it with our mouths, it does solidify it for us, and it becomes truth for us. And as we rehearse those statements, those voices, versus all the negativity, 
Oh, I'm so stupid. I can't believe I did that. Why would anyone want me? All the things that she's saying about herself. Oh, I've got all these red flags. I've been married too many times. You're wiser. You're more experienced. You're more compassionate. You have benefits from the suffering. So I'm going to give you a minute or so, and I want you just to argue with those voices. Then I'm going to take you through a, uh, a declaration of some statements that I have made that set us up for affirming ourselves. I'm going to give you a minute right now. You've been thinking negative thoughts about yourself. Just talk to God about that. Ask him what he thinks about that. Is that a reason that he would say that you're not beautiful, you're not intelligent, you're not precious to him, you're not a treasure? Okay, well, let's, uh, I'm going to say these said for Deborah, and I want us to say them together. Just repeat this after me. Um, I am beautiful. So I said this for Deborah, and she, she said sort of, okay, I, I'll say it, I'm, I'm beautiful. I said, no, 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 say it, say it like you mean it. She said, okay, I'm, 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 I'm beautiful. A little more volume, Deborah, a little more volume. And then she gets this smile, okay, I, I am beautiful. And, and she felt it. And so when we say this, we want to, want to say it like we believe it. So let's say it one more time. I am beautiful. I am a treasure. I am valuable. I am intelligent. You know, when we say things like that, sometimes we, we immediately say, yeah, but so-and-so is more intelligent. Right? That, I, know how, I know how your mind is working, right? Yeah, but. So today we're going to, to set some of that aside because God gave you your intelligence and there, you have blessings that other people don't have, and you don't have some of the blessings that other people have. And we are a whole society of comparers. We are always looking to see what someone else has that we don't have. And a lot of our lack of joy stems from those comparisons. And so today, and this weekend, we are going to take joy in what we have, not what we don't have. Because I believe we can all find or think about uh, people who are not as intelligent as we are. Oh, that's actually, we usually don't think of that, but now that we think about it, there are whole bunches of people not as intelligent, or had their intelligence and lost it, or never had it. And so I want you to just even think about that and start getting some gratitude. Gratitude is another thing we're going to work on a little bit this weekend. Yeah. I am smarter than a lot of people. And that is, that is what God wants you to be thankful for. Thankfulness is actually, the Bible calls it a sacrifice. Sometimes it takes some effort because of all this stuff going on in our head. The sacrifice of thanksgiving, the sacrifice of praise. We are going to give the sacrifice of thanksgiving because it actually takes a little bit of effort. You know, and say, God, thank you. Yeah, you actually, with this mind, I have gotten out of some fixes. I have gotten myself, I've been able to make dinner, I've been able to, whatever it is, I want you to start taking some joy in the intelligence that you have. And the things that are working for you instead of the things that aren't working for you, which is where we spend most of our time. And we'll talk about why, how the brain, why the brain does that a little bit later. So let's say it again. I am intelligent. intelligent. There we go. Uh, I am precious. I choose to enjoy and be grateful for the physical resources I have been given. I am thankful that this body has gotten me this far. There we go. There's some gratitude, right? Right? We're always thinking about what's not working. This body has gotten me this far. Uh, how about this? I will not compare my insides with someone else's outsides. 
Let's say that together. I will not compare my inside with someone else's outsides. Right? We are a society of comparers. It is the beautiful to get all the attention. You know what? What you have inside, what you have suffered through, what you have lived through, the relationships that you have, priceless, priceless. TV and all of that stuff is always comparing the externals. What is inside of you is going to be with you forever. Forever is a very long time. So let's say it again. I will not compare, will not compare my, insides my insides with someone else's outsides. <laughs> I've made mistakes, I've made mistakes but, I've but I've learned from them. I'm fun to be with. I bring things to this world world. that nobody else brings. I am unique unique. and special. special. I do some things better than others others. and some things worse. worse. Other Other people will enjoy being with me. Not everyone will enjoy being with me. (laughs) And that's okay. okay. People don't determine my value. value. Who does? Amen. God does. When I fail to live up to my standards, I will be kind to myself. I give myself permission permission to make mistakes mistakes and to learn from them and to to grow. grow. I like myself. myself. Amen. 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 I'm just going to stop there and take a break, uh, and we will finish the story of Deborah. Uh, after the break. Let me just pray a blessing on you. God, thank you for bringing everyone here today. I'm so happy that they all made it here. I ask a special dispensation of your love on them, that each one in this room would start to feel, or to feel in a greater measure, how dearly and deeply and and, uh, profoundly they are loved. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, thank you. Thank you.